Won't somebody please buy Hudson Soft a birthday cake? All this and more coming up on This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Atari goes intelligent. The return of Sprint. And Hudson turned 50. All these stories and a lot more coming up on today's show. Up to date news for out of date tech. Good morning. Good morning, Dave. How are you? I am wonderful this morning. Absolutely raring to go. Never mind the insomnia. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm going to be fine. I'm all excited now we're recording, though. For some reason, hitting that button it gives me a burst of energy. How are you, Good. Neil? Good, good. I'm well. I've, I believe I had a few more hours sleep than you because you burn the candle at both ends, don't you, Dave? Up all night playing V pinball. You will, yeah. I'm at my, I wasn't expecting it, but my my virtual pinball table arrived a few days ago. It is huge. It is slightly taller than me. It's amazing. Um, it's got very rubbish uh, computer inside it, which I knew. But even that still still makes it fun to play these tables on it. The construction of it is is fantastic. I've already bought the PC to go inside it. I've got lots to do and lots to learn about these Pinscape control boards, which is a, a project kind of similar to Mr. in terms of it uses a, a development board and mm-hmm. someone else has put new software on it. Lots to learn, lots to do with it. It's going to be fantastic. going to take me a while. Good, and you've spoken about everything there except actually playing it. Is it going to be one of those projects? No, I have been playing it. I've been oh, playing it quite a lot. And it's, okay. as I said, that despite the computer and it being rubbish, it's still enjoyable to play it, even though it's a little bit laggy and the ball jumps and so on. Right. And that's why, of course, I'm replacing everything with um, super high-end stuff and try and get 120 frames per second rather than the three or four frames per second awesome. it sometimes does. There was a comment last week just uh, chuckling at your choice of graphics card and the power you're throwing at this thing. But, you know, it's a PC at the end of the day. If you get yeah. bored with it, you can put the old guts back in. You can assign that PC to something else. You know, it's always good to have a powerful PC around. Yeah, on top of it, I have bought a new monitor to go inside it that runs at 120 hertz. So um, the graphics card f- at 4K with all these special effects going on, at 120 hertz, it needs that to do to do it for some of them. So yeah, it's 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 certainly um, worthwhile. How many is, uh, how many hertz does a real pinball table run at, Dave? Infinite, <laughs> infinite, <laughs> infinite hertz. hertz. Yes, <laughs> everybody hurts. Um, we were due to have a guest this week. Unfortunately, the guest is not well, so yeah. we will be going without the guest. And I don't want to embarrass the guest by saying who it was, so they will forever remain anonymous. Yeah, get well soon, Nolan Bushnell. Yeah. And there it, is was, a- it, it was an Atari expert, wasn't it? Which, yeah. was, which was exciting. I was looking forward to having some Atari representation. And we will. I think we're just going to yeah. rebook, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. Um, And we've got a correction, a very important correction on a lie that you told us last (laughs) week, Neil. (laughs) A terrible lie. Last week you said you had the college coming on Friday. That wasn't true, was it? (laughs) Well, in my mind it was. So uh, I am reviewing my booking system because there was obviously a terrible mistake somewhere. Loud and clear on my booking system, I had... 30 kids from the local college turning up on Friday um, to have a day in the cave and the arcade and a special guest speaker because this was a game development course and a guest speaker from a, um, a game studio to inspire them. Uh, and I thought, brilliant, all set up for Friday. Come on, Wednesday. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm setting up my cameras. I'm starting to film. I'm thinking I've got to get a morning's work in because the BBC are coming to film in the afternoon. And... Uh, Ben comes up from uh, from Heber downstairs and says, Neil, do you know there's a minibus outside with 30 kids in it? <laughs> you can imagine the language that came out of my mouth. And, um, yeah, they, they came on Wednesday. So I don't know where the error was. I thought, to be honest, a million emails went back and forth. There was a lot of arranging with this one. So uh, it, it's more than likely it was my fault. And um, I... There were a lot of fortunate things happened on this day. A, I was there because sometimes I'm home um, editing. Uh, B, I was 
smartly dressed because the BBC were coming and, and see also because the BBC were coming, the cave was tidy. It could have been an absolute bomb site. I could have been mid filming. I could have, I could have just not been there. So somehow a lot of good luck was on my side, quickly turned everything on, invited them in, made them coffees, um, settled them in, called the guest speaker and said, you know, you're coming on Friday. Uh, any chance you can come today? Yes, I'll get straight in my car, came over. Uh, and then Dan, a volunteer, um, or Dan from Retrified, jumped in his car and came and supported me and it all came together and everyone had a lovely day. And then the icing on top was the kids got to be in the BBC report in the afternoon when they were filming, we got them involved. So actually it turned out to be a fabulous day, but wow, they caught me on the back foot. Yeah, and uh, it, it was already going to be an exceptional busy, exceptionally busy week for you. Mm. So I think you ended up having cave sessions on Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, so Saturday, uh, Alex Arcade Archive did a wonderful day with Whitney. So Whitney um, came over from the US, and Whitney is who Alex did the Skyskipper project with, which was the unreleased Nintendo arcade that they uh, discovered and built. And... Um, did a wonderful talk. Everyone had a lovely time. It was a full house on Saturday. So I was I was sort of facilitating that day. I was behind the scenes greasing the wheels while Alex uh, pressed the flesh, as, as you say. Um, <laughs> Saturday was regular morning and afternoon sessions. So, yeah, I think I'm on a 21-day run. Um, and then after next week, I've got a four-day holiday, hmm. which is not really a holiday because uh, because of the whole adoption process. Um, the social worker said, right, before the next phase, you guys really need to take a holiday, get some rest um, and recharge because there's a lot going to go on. So we booked a little four-day mini break in the Forest of Dean and then we get a call. We've got an important meeting for you guys to do with the adoption. It can only happen on this particular date, which is in the middle of our holiday. <laughs> so we're going to have to get in the car and drive an hour away to to, to go to this meeting. Ah, no rest for me, Dave. No rest for me. It's a bank holiday today as we're recording, Neil. Are you maybe going to take the day off today? No, or is it too much on? No, I, I'm excited actually because I'm working on the Sega Terra Drive, which is oh, a, yes. an IBM PC with a Mega Drive built in. Yeah, very scary. Yeah. yeah, so it's not working, but there's a lot of history around it. And then, of course, we will endeavour to get it working. Over your head, that Terra Drive, scary. Uh, yeah, okay, I get it. <sighs> Shall we go on with the stories, Neil? Not like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let, let's. It's not spell that. Is it not spell that? No, I'm not allowed to make the joke then. No. No, you're not. No, I'm not. I'm not in the mood for jokes today, Dave. <laughs> no jokes for the rest of <laughs> today's <laughs> session. It's going to be the most serious podcast we've ever done. In 2017, Tommy Tallarico, who should maybe be described as a bit of a character, bought a stake in in television productions. And the next year, in 2018, he announced that they were going to re-release a new reimagined version of the Intellivision called the Amico, and it would be done by crowdfunding. Amico? Not, not Amico. Amico. Either's fine, I think. Either's fine. Tommy Tellerico, it sounds like a NASCAR driver, doesn't it? Yeah. It's quite yeah. a name. I wonder if that's his real name, Tommy Tallarico. Hmm. It's the kind of name you might choose yourself. Um, it has been a catastrophic failure so far. In fact, today's story is prompted by Atari coming in and kind of potentially sort of rescuing it by buying everything else apart from the Amico or the Amico. Uh, but I'll come back to the Amico Amico in a bit. The Intellivision itself was a competitor to the Atari VCS, the 2600. It did do well. It sold around 5 million units. Um, it's one of these things in retro that we don't talk about so much because we talk about the Atari 2600, so we don't talk about the Intellivision because they were kind of the same place in the market. Um, you might remember it as having what looks like a home phone handset connected by a spiral cable to the main unit. But what looks like a speaker is actually a, a spinner or a paddle, as they were called back in the day. Um, generally, games are better on the Intellivision than the 2600 when they are well made because the Intellivision is more capable than the 2600, generally speaking. Uh, the Intellivision did exist in the UK, 
launching a couple of years later than the US in 1981, although I don't know anything about it in the UK. I think perhaps it, it, it maybe predates us, Neil. Um, it did have a keyboard component, which added a 6502 called the Blue Whale. Um, however, it never actually um, made it to market. Uh, it was always marketed as a modular thing, the, the whole console thing with the base unit being the console. Uh, but in fact, they failed to release it. And at one point, they were paying the FTC, which is a, an American government body, rumoured to be $10,000 a month as a fine until they eventually did cancel it to release something else called the ETC. The, um, the Intellivision, I also associate it with that 2600 era, but it's worth remembering it was actually a, technically a generation after, really, wasn't it, than the 2600? Mm. It was more sort of 5200. Yes, that's true, but it did tend to end up getting the same games ported across. Yeah. Going back to the current day, and there is some kind of mirror to it. The crowdfunding of 2020 has failed to materialise with an Amico in the hands of the backers. The Amico is designed to be a console for non-gamers, so think something like couch gaming for the whole family, um, maybe along the lines of Nintendo Wii to some extent, um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I think it's certainly living up to that as everyone that has backed it is now not an Amico gamer. <laughs> um, within a year, big problems were being reported and doubts were being talked about. Many of the original games for it, many of the games that were uh, touted to be original were in fact going to be ports of iOS and Android games. They announced that rather than the 15 to 30% taken by, for example, Apple on their platform, they'd take, take at least 50% on their platform. And a year later, it turned out that the Amico game Tank Battle had just lifted and stolen assets from the very popular mobile game World of Tanks and other sources. I don't know why you'd think you'd get away with that. Didn't they dip into NFCs at some point as well? Yes, yeah, yeah they did. They, they sold games that didn't exist, and they, they were just doing anything to get some money in. Mm. The same year, Tommy Tallarico stepped down as CEO but remained on the board and as the, the, still the biggest shareholder. In 2023, they announced they had run out of money and they wouldn't be able to release the console without more money, and they spun up a mobile app to sell their games on a mobile app. Now, that really undermines the whole point of the console. We've already undermined it by the fact it's iOS and Android ports, and then they're going to sell their games on iOS and Apple anyway, so what's the point of the console that they can't make? Um, but in fact, the, the theme of the the whole thing, we're now in 2024, the theme of the past four years has been to get more money in. And where has the money gone? It's gone to pay wages of the people involved in the project, but they've not made any consoles. So people have been paid a lot of money from all the money. It's been the millions and millions that have been raised, but they haven't actually do, done the console. So I'm aware of libel laws. Uh, or aware that exist, I'm not an expert on them, but I'm being careful in what I say. I can't say what the motivations of the people involved were. My guess, I would say that I don't think that from the outset they were there to scam people. I think they were there to try and make this console. Um, but the end result is that a lot of people have been paid a lot of money to fail to deliver the hardware promised. And this latest cash injection from Atari means at least the Intellivision name and everything that, in my opinion, is worthwhile has been taken away from Talarico and his crew. And frankly, now I don't think it matters what happens with the Amico because it's separate to the rest of a television, which is now with Atari. My, my expectation is that they'll use this money to keep paying themselves until it runs out and then try some other way to get some money in and we'll never see the Amico. But who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. This will make you laugh, Dave. If you go to Amazon.co.uk, you can find the Intellivision Amico. It's two hundred thirty nine ninety five pre order. This item will be released on December thirty first, twenty twenty five. So they're still they're, they're taking money through Amazon for this thing. Oh, so they're back That's doing crazy, that again, isn't it? They, they, they've got they've kept going back to the market and 
kept getting money and people that there are some people who are, are are so invested in this they believe it's going to happen and they're they're not happy if you talk it down at all but i, I mean my advice by opinion to anyone is don't give them a penny of your money i think after what's going on so far you should wait until they bring something to market before you give them any money because of the the amount of people that are now out of pocket as a result but going back to the original on television i would recommend demon attack as a game to play um neil what do you make of all of this wow it's a big meaty subject isn't it um just going back to that amazon listing i should point out that Pretty much anyone can list something on Amazon, so there's no guarantee that that is the uh, official thing that's just popped up. As official as it looks... Who's selling it on Amazon? Is it uh, Amazon themselves? Let's have a look. Uh, how, how can you tell? Because you've got Amazon Marketplace, haven't you? And then you've got... Yeah. So it, is, it, is it Amazon Marketplace selling it, or is it Amazon themselves selling it? Well, I don't... You have a little look, Dave. I'll send you the link. You have a little look while I share my thoughts. I'll put it in the, in the chat there. So, yeah, I'm not sure if that is the official listing, but you'll check that. Now that they're putting the games as mobile apps, uh, now this is on the assumption that they will actually ever release anything, but is the Amico a, an Android-based console? Because perhaps just to tie everything up, they'll just chuck out a, a cheap Android console that's just something pre-existing uh, with some branded on and then just play those mobile games that they've already put out there. Is that... Is that the goal? I don't, it look it looks like an Android console. To, I don't know the yeah. one the one on Amazon there at two hundred and thirty nine ninety five is dispatched and sold from Amazon. So it's not Amazon Marketplace. This is officially Amazon doing it. But I guess they'll end up just re, refunding people it's, if it's not done. And I suppose it's safe to buy it on Amazon because you will get a refund. Well, it feels safe, but. Um it's going to get them in trouble. Unlike Kickstarter, where they could just walk away and go, well, mm. we tried our best. Yeah. Amazon surely are going to hold them bang to rights. So. Depends on what they'd actually release. I mean, if they just need to release something that looks like that, that does what it says. So like your idea, if they do put a, a cheap Android device in there, there's certainly plenty of money in that £240 to do it, then maybe they get away with it. Mm. An Android know. in a commode with an Amico logo. Yeah. Yeah. That's, what it, that's kind of what it looks like, isn't it? <laughs> the design of it. Anyway, let's talk about UK gaming specifically. So the Intellivision, like you, for me, it was before my time, but then so was the Atari VCS, and I was acutely aware of that at the time, well into the late 80s. Um, and that's because the, the Atari console it lived on under various cost-reduced versions, and it had its successors. So that was always around in the 80s. It was always in the Argos catalog. There were always some Atari 2600 VCSs, the Junior, the cost-reduced ones, and then the 5200, 7800, and all the rest. But for me, the Intellivision, it just didn't register. I was obviously looking at the page. I don't remember seeing it. It must have been there. It just didn't register. You had your Ataris. You had your grandstand Pong clones, your cheap Pong clones. <laughs> and then you had your NES and your Master System in that section of the cabinet. And, um, yeah, just, just didn't see it. It must have been there. Likewise, we got the ColecoVision as well, didn't we? I just just did, don't remember it at all. Totally zero recollection. They did um, they did cost reduce the Intellivision, so there was more than the original Intellivision. They did come out with other ones that, in the same way that the Atari Jun, uh, 2600 Jun, Junior did. So it, it, it was there. It, ju it just didn't catch on. But, again, I would go back to what I said about this and we've talked about this before, this idea in retro that there's room to talk about one thing. So when you talk about 16-bit uh, microcomputers, we talk about the Amiga more than we should. We talk about the Nintendo Entertainment System more than we should. We talk about the, the Spectrum, perhaps, in UK uh, microcomputing more than we should. And we talk about the 2600 more than in television just because it's the, it's the big one. Yeah, and that's why it's nice to have guests sometimes to uh, to correct us and steer us or, or just mm. inform us of their view from their part of the world. Um, and I think, speaking of different parts of the world, that's why the Amico Kickstarter fascinated me because it was obviously a system with a very large and dedicated following in its region to drum up the support that it did. And 
for me, it was probably much like someone from the US watching the ZX Spectrum next Kickstarter, which went ballistic. You know, the Amico Kickstarter, I don't know how much it raised, but it was pretty huge, wasn't it? It was, yeah, it it was, was a big number. Millions and millions. So that's a good comparison because the next first Kickstarter was in 2020, the same year the Amico started taking pre-orders and also did its crowdfunding. The ZX Spectrum Nexts were delivered, and then they did a second Kickstarter for round two, and there were delays because of supply chain issues during the pandemic, but they they navigated that. They figured it all out, and Kickstarter two of the ZX Spectrum Next was delivered. So that's two rounds done. And in that time, not a single Amico <laughs> was made or delivered. So I'm with you, Dave. I wouldn't put a penny into the Amico project or, for that matter, any future projects that their names are associated with because based on what we've seen so far, zero confidence in that whole yeah. project. We have another Atari acquisition to add to the list, and the good news hopefully will be some of these Intellivision assets that exist. Well, perhaps maybe there'll be Atari 2600 cartridges for the, the Atari 2600 Plus. I don't know. Yeah, I forgot. Sorry, I forgot the, how this story started. It started yeah. with Atari have bought out Intellivision um Completely assets. Yeah. assets bought out their assets except for the Intellivision. Is yeah. that right? Except for the Amico. Except for the Amico. So the Intellig- Intellivision back catalogue is now in Atari's yes. hands to have some yeah. fun with. Um, yeah. And I think that is probably a safer pair of hands. Yeah, maybe we'll get the Intellivision 50th type thing as long as we, same mm-hmm. as we had with Atari. So there you go. This week's show is kindly sponsored by Give Me a P. P. Give Me a C. C. Give me a B. B. Way. Way. <laughs> what, is, what have we got, Dave? PCBWay.com. Fantastic. They are our sponsors, creators of PCBs, manufacturers of 3D prints, CNC milling, all of that good stuff that you might want for your project and home of the shared projects section where you can look up um, PCBs for all of your favorite retro systems. And at the click of a button, get the bare PCB sent to you so you can solder them up yourself or uh, get a quote to have them fully populated and sent to you. Um, I am currently um, inquiring about a price for a fully populated TI-99 multi-cart, Dave, at the request of a, a patron coming to the next patron day. I wanted a multi-cart for that system. I'm looking at, well, I haven't looked yet, but I, I know that I might need Pinscape boards, which is the yeah. the control boards for the others. There's, there's there's Pinscape kind of breakout boards and things with pulse width modulation for high high power things like solenoids and so on that you can get the boards printed at PCB way, and I, I might do that and expand the Pinscape and get all the the shakers and the and the knockers and all the rest of it done. Movers, shakers, and knockers for Dave. Yeah. Will you solder them up yourself, or will you get them populated? I'll likely solder them up myself because yeah. it's not too difficult the soldering for it, MOSFETs that's and so on. That's the fun part of it, isn't it? Yeah. So we thank PCBWay.com for supporting the show. Go and check them out. I've got another Atari story for you today, Dave. That's going to make you happy, isn't it? Hmm. Um, it does feel good to be talking about Atari this week in the context of video games and not hotels, not casinos, and not crypto. We, we've we've come on in, in recent years, haven't we? And um, yeah. the, the ship has been steadied and put back on course because uh, this week Atari have announced a new game called Neo Sprint. This is the latest installment in their top-down racing series, which started all the way back in 1976 with Sprint 2. That's 48 years ago. Video game history is getting long and um, illustrious, isn't it? And that's not even the first. Why, why is it called Sprint 2? I know the answer, but I'm prompting <laughs> you. Here. I'll come to that, Dave. I'll come to that. So um, Sprint 2 was a huge success at the time. It was a, a racing game with a fixed bird's eye view. So you're looking bird's down, eye. single screen, Captain Bird's Eye looking down on you. <laughs> and um, <laughs> You've got the accent. Uh, it, it leveraged this newfangled thing called the microprocessor to make the opponents more intelligent. You actually had AI of a sort. So the cars wouldn't just follow a predetermined path around the track. They would actually they give you passwords away. Was that what they would do? They'd give you passwords away. <laughs> Behave. They would drive themselves, Dave, around the track. So if you actually accidentally gave them a bump, they would 
they would not get back onto that predetermined line. They would just find their way around the track from their new position. Uh, it was a two-player game with two steering wheels, a four-way gear stick, a pedal to accelerate, but there was no brake pedal. So they had brake pedals in earlier games like Grand Track, and they they thought, no, we'll just have... Uh, they were ahead of the game, Dave. They said, we'll have regenerative, regenerative braking. <laughs> you just take your foot off the pedal and you slow down to make it nice and easy. And anyone who has played this or any of the subsequent sprint games will remember well that that wheel spinning technique where you really sling the wheel around corners from side to side, left to right. And you can never really fully emulate that on home ports with a joystick or a keyboard. Even if you're in MAME playing the original arcade ROM, never feels quite the same as slinging that, that steering wheel around. Very American feeling steering wheel as well, wasn't it? It was like a deep steering wheel with the chrome center and uh, the hard plastics around it. It was nothing really like, it was more like a bumper car. That's what I'd liken it to the most. Do you know the ones I mean, Dave? I, I know what you mean, but at the time, I never really thought about the difference between the t- steering wheels. I just It was just a steering wheel to me. Yeah, I guess you weren't driving at the time, so no, the steering wheel yeah. was a steering wheel. No yes. frame of reference, yeah. <laughs> I do remember flinging it, though, to get around the corners, yeah. and I remember the, 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 the graphic of the car, the back end spinning out, and that was a, that was a really, real, real big part of the game. It wasn't realistic, but it was a, a real big part of the game was that kind of that, that skidding around the corners. Well, that may well have been one of the later ones you were playing, which we'll come on to, unless mm. it was Sprint 2. Were you playing the black and white one? I don't think so. It was no, It was no. almost certainly one of the later ones. Yeah. So the original Sprint 2 spent three years in the top three uh, earnings of arcades in the US, and it was that success which laid the foundation for the, the long-standing series that followed. So we had Sprint 2, so-called because two for two-player. Then quite unintuitively, we had Sprint 1, released two years later in 78. So that was Sprint 1 was single player. So that answers your question, Dave. Why was it called Sprint 2? We also got Sprint 4 and Sprint 8. So eight players on this gigantic machine. It was like a cocktail machine that you all stood around with a steering wheel each, eyeballing each other. It was a great setup. And you had that sense of competitive gaming and also really intuitive gameplay. So just like Pong, because this is still the early days of arcades, you walk up to Pong, you see a bat and ball, and you know instantly you've got to bop that ball past your opponent, and you've got to block it with your bat. With your bat, you walk up to a, a racing track, you're looking down on it, you see a steering wheel, and you instantly know I have to be the fastest around this track. It's it's exactly what an arcade should do, um, and it's it's a great lesson. Something we've been talking about recently with that computer space rebuild uh, on the channel, and yeah. why that wasn't a success. This is you can understand why this was a success. Yeah. Super Sprint appeared in 1986, so this might have been what you played, Dave. This was a full 10 years after the original, and this upgraded us from black and white to full color graphics, and instead of the insane eight-way cabinet, we had three steering wheels in its design. Um, Still a fairly compact design cabinet, considering it had three steering wheels, so arcade operators could still fit it in the, the door and into their arcades. And then that was complemented the same year by Championship Sprint. And that was a two-player version, pretty much the same game, but it did have some different tracks added. Uh, And then both of the games, you also had the upgrade shop screen, which became quite uh, a feature in these types of games. So between courses, you would spend your winnings to upgrade your car. Cars would get faster. Golden spanners, yeah. Car would get faster. Racing would become more competitive you'd lose, you'd have to put more money in and you'd be invested in your upgrades. So you'd want to continue so you don't lose all of your upgrades. It's, um, yeah, an early precursor to mobile gaming and all the hooks and uh, addictive things they throw in to keep you playing and putting your money in. So, um, yeah, I think I, like you, Dave, probably played either Super Sprint or Championship Sprint yep. first, yep. Yep. Uh, the color one. And then uh, there was a final game in the series, until now, uh, which was called Badlands. And that was a complete tangent. That was a post-apocalyptic world, like a Mad Max version of Championship Sprint, two-player, came out in 1989. And then that was it until until now with this new offering of Neo Sprint. Uh, And before we get on to Neo Sprint, let's talk about the old ones or or even games that are similar to to this that you enjoyed, Dave. Are you a fan of the uh, Sprint series? I'm... 
nearly certain that I played games which were knockoffs of Super Sprint on my CPC before I played Super Sprint in the arcade. I definitely remember playing Codemasters Grand Prix Simulator, mm-hmm. Iron Man's Off Road, which I think was by Codemasters as well. Mm. Maybe, was it not? Iron Man Super Off Road. That was. I don't think that was Codemasters put that out. No. Mm. And I, and there was one on bikes. I think as the MX well. Simulator. That that might be it. Uh, not, there was probably a motorbike one as well. Yeah. Not not Ninja. Uh, scooter simulator Neil your favourite <laughs> game uh, not that but yeah I definitely played a lot of those in the CPC and while I did have Super Sprint on my Atari ST in fact I, I, I was sure it was in the Atari ST power pack but I did a quick Google and no it wasn't or at least not what I found on Google the power pack did slightly change from time to time so there's still a possibility it was Funny, I, I did exactly the same. I thought, oh, surely Atari would have included that in the power in the Atari Power Pack. Nope, wasn't there. It just surprised me. Um, just to go back to um, Ivan Iron Man Stewart Super Off Road, uh, that was published by Virgin Games and Trade West. Oh well, there you go. Um, there you go. And there were ports by Graft Gold and Software Creations, yeah. depending on what platform you were on. So no, that wasn't a Cody's one. I did play Super Spent on my ST, but by that point. I was on to what I think was superior games, that the kind of evolution of it, Supercars and Supercars 2, which were tremendous games, still top-down racing, a bit zoomed in, but with more or more depth to them, more of a management angle going on in the background, obviously inspired by what happened in Super Sprint and Championship Sprint, but taken further with um, lots more you could do, change the cars, and of course they added missiles and all sorts of stuff as well. So I think they were the evolution of it. I'm aware of Micro Machines. I never played Micro Machines, but I'm aware of it. Um, but yeah, for, for me, Super Cars and Super Cars 2 were the pinnacle of this style of gameplay. Yeah, there's definitely evolution there. Um, and it wasn't until I saw Sprint 8 that I realized where Sega got their inspiration from for the Hot Rod Arcade, which was before Supercars, similar game to Supercars, but it had that cocktail-style cabinet with the steering wheels all all the way around the cabinet, um, which I think is a great way to game. I'd love to get hold of one of those. But Supercars, Supercars 2, um, Nitro. I mean, that that's. did you ever play that, Nitro? That was published by Psygnosis. Rings a bell. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how much i play it i wonder if it, if i got it after i got supercars or supercars yeah. 2 then they, they would have they would have killed it for me and of course skid marks yeah. skid marks um inspired by if not sprint then super off-road which in turn was inspired by um the sprint series are you still do you still suffer from skid marks uh, super skid marks no yes. epic skid marks now epic skid marks.com there you go you've got super skid marks yeah, I've got that and the track pack, famously made on Blitz Basic. Um, <laughs> great game, great game. Epic, uh, Epic Skid Marks, we need to explain what that is. Uh, Epic Skid Marks is, well, epicskidmarks.com. You can go and play it right now online and um, have a little race around. So long as the lag doesn't get you, sometimes it's a bit laggy, but uh, it's it's good fun. Um, yeah, just a, it, it's a genre, isn't it? The bird's eye top-down racing game. And... I think there is a lot to be said. I know we've we've talked about supercars and the scrolling type games, and then there's also the isometric type style racing games, a a different style again. But I think there's a lot to be said for that static single screen bird's eye type view. I I really like that. And the way the cars moved as well, just wonderful. So Atari have announced this new game called Neo Sprint. It's got a page on Steam. It's due for release on the 27th of June, so just about a month's time. It's developed by a studio called Headless Chicken Games. I've not heard of. They seem to have a a history of porting, um, coming up with assets for other games and working with other studios. So it's not a completely unknown quantity. And first impressions from the teaser videos that they've shared, I think they're actually very good. I don't know if you've seen these, Dave, but I think it... It feels like it captures the feel of the original. The cars, this is really important to me, they look like they move and they look like they slide around the corners Mm -hmm. in exactly the way that they should. They've really nailed the look of that. It supports uh, eight local players. There's no mention of how it might work online, but surely there's got to be an online match-up, eight-player, multi. 
in this day and age, it has to exist. Uh, and it's got a course builder, which looks like a lot of fun. So I can really see myself setting this up on a big screen with eight jury pads. And I can see this being a real crowd pleaser at the arcade or in the cave and it getting the same reaction of joy and competition exactly the same way. I mean, really, I should get a big telly, right? This should be my V pinball, Dave. I should get a big telly. I should set up a sit down cocktail style cabinet. I don't know that the game will actually support steering wheels. <laughs> I don't think it's really made for that, but we could have eight joy pads around it and everyone looking down, eyeballing each other, shoulder to shoulder racing. I think that would be a wonderful way to do it. You'll need to get Richard to 3D print the joy pads so that you've got one to match the colour of the cars on the screen <laughs> so that you really do know you, I'm purple you know car, car, I'm purple you car. Yeah, yeah. A bit like um, when you used to stand by the pond and you had the row of steering wheels for the remote control boats. I loved them. I'm I was thinking, never allowed to play on them. Remember in the arcade, you used to have the horse racing one? Yes. Where you'd put your coins in and pick your horse, and they would go on and and the horses would stop moving. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> I also think that this kind of game is, is great for that what you've described in comparison to something like Street Fighter 2. Because the problem with Street Fighter 2 is I could go and I, I could see what was going on, but anyone who's got any skill at Street Fighter 2 will beat me every single time. Whereas with this, you might get a bit lucky, you can have a bit of fun, you can feel as if you can compete in it. Whereas so many other games require this this skill and knowledge that if someone else has got it, then it's no competition. Yeah, it's as pick up and play as it's ever been. So I will put that on my list of projects to do. Uh, once I've tried the game, because obviously this is not an endorsement, it's a it's a preview that's up on Steam. It looks good. I'll give it a play at home. And if it lives up to expectations, and if I can guarantee that they won't switch off a service and stop me from being able to play it in 10 years' time, <laughs> this needs to be a permanent installation, then I'll make that happen. And of course... In the Arcade Archive, we do have a Sprint 2, an original 1976 Sprint 2 arcade, which Holly, hi Holly, I know you're listening, has been working really hard on fixing the uh, black and white screen for it. She has, she tells us, finally fixed it and is going to bring it back in and we can tie up that restoration and that series so we can have a Sprint 2 and this would be a lovely thing to complement it next to it. And I really hope that uh, the game lives up to the the very strong legacy of Sprint. Housekeeping. It's your favourite part of the show. Is there any housekeeping to be had? I'd like to welcome on two new patrons. Um, so thank you very much to Serpent Chain and Matty C64C. Thank you and welcome. Welcome. You are now official twirlers. You may take a twirl now, <laughs> along with all the twirlers. All the twirlers need to twirl right now. Uh, thank you for, for signing up. Um, if someone does want to sign up, Neil, where would they go to? You can go to patreon.com forward slash this week in retro, become an official twirler on, on any tier that you'd like to, and um, we will be eternally grateful for your support. Uh, so thank you, everyone who does that. You'll also gain access to part two of the Q and A, which uh, oh, yeah. by the time this episode is out will be live. I'll I'll be putting it on today or tomorrow. Um, so yeah, you've got that to do, you have to do as well as our eternal gratitude. Um, it's a quiet week for housekeeping this week, which is a nice change because normally there's been lots to talk about. I was surprised there's no big backlash at my um, saying last week the Amiga died. Um, you've got, you've although, got to troll harder, Dave. You just although I know I I, <laughs> I, I, I won't say things I don't really mean without saying immediately afterwards. I don't mean that. Um, I, I think we're quite balanced about it. Um, although there is one comment from Gary Gray that says, "So is the Atari ST dead?" Uh, the Atari ST would never die. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> On to news in brief. News in brief, our first uh, story. So these are stories that you've submitted. And just a reminder, you can go to reddit.com forward slash this week in retro. This is how the show works. You submit news stories that are of a retro flavor that you think we might find interesting. And uh, some of them we pick out for our main stories. Others appear in brief. But it is a lovely resource for you to just browse and flick through mm. the stories, uh, regardless of what's in the show. So we appreciate all of your submissions. Thank you. Please do keep it up. 
First one's from Paul, a.k.a. Homeski, and this is about um, a vintage arcade collection that's coming up for auction. So a collection of over 80 machines dating back to the 1890s is going up for auction. Uh, the story says it's expected to fetch £100,000 in total. I think if I had the money, I think I would probably snap this up because it's a lovely chunk of pre-video game history. We're talking about lovely wooden cabinets, um, things that hang on the wall. We're talking about one-armed bandits, um, early electromechanical games, lots of lovely stuff. And uh, I've put the link in the show notes for, for Duncan to share with you so you can browse through because they are being sold as individual lots over at Hanson's Auction House. Um, and there is a mini Sega one that stood out for me. It's just a little blue box. Looks like a mini refrigerator with the Sega logo on the front. It's from the 1960s. And then on the top of it is a tiny, tiny uh, fruit machine. You've got the three um, reels. Uh, and some somewhere there's a button or an arm that you pull. Uh, and it's just like a, a normal fruit machine, but tiny, a really mini Sega fruit machine. It's so cute. Uh, go and have a browse. There's lots of cool stuff there. I am. Um, I did look at a hundred thousand. I thought it was a lot, and then I thought, well, hang on. All you need is maybe six or seven individual items that are rare and worth and worth a lot, and that brings it right up. I'm sure that of the eighty machines there, some will be common or not worth much, but a few that are worth a bit will will do that. And I yeah. don't really know how how well preserved the the, the pre electronic kind of the pre pre um silicon conductor the pre the pre microprocessor that's what i'm looking for pre microprocessor ones are whether there are lots of them around and they're easy to preserve or whether they are rare and valuable well these these ones do look well preserved the the chap is in his uh, i think he's 89 years old the chap who's selling the collection right. off collected over the years he his trade was a cabinet making so uh -huh. he's got the the wooden cabinets down to mm -hmm. a fine art and he's had help with uh, the mechanical side of it because a lot of it is mechanical rather than electronic yes uh, so it all seems to be in very good condition yeah i'm thinking the sheriff that you have mm -hmm. um yeah i don't know how much the sheriff you have is worth but it, it's not worth less than 1250 i would imagine which is the average price if these are all mm. uh, all 80 come out at 100,000 yeah we'll try and remember to come back to this when when all is sold and done but jacko has let us know that for the first time in 28 years super mario 64 which is the the, the kind of one where you see uh, is a 3d kind of perspective uh, has been completed without using the a button which means jumping that's right no jumping <laughs> which doesn't make sense to me how you can do it without jumping but someone's done it um the, these console and nintendo fans spend too much time doing things you shouldn't do oh, um, no they do what makes them happy dave <laughs> and if that um, means completing super uh, mario 64 with no jump then so do it <laughs> I was harking back to the, remember the Tetris one where the, the newsreader said that it was terrible that the guy spent so long playing Tetris oh, yes. and broke it. Get outside, yeah. get a life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, G7VFY has submitted a story about the Nokia N95, which says it brought smartphones to the masses. Did it really? Um, the N95 doesn't, it doesn't ring a bell. It didn't stand out for me. Watch the video. And I think I still came around thinking, okay, it's got some smartphone elements, but I don't think that's the one that lit the fire, is it? Um, the iPhone, the, it's got to be the iPhone that lit the fire there. The the masses, has, but it? Yeah, maybe, maybe it, it paved the way for the iPhone. It's certainly the iPhone wasn't. The iPhone was an innovation in marketing, perhaps, is the way to put it. Yeah, well, have a watch and decide for yourselves, as with all these No, no, stories. it's the phone, not the watch. Oh, Dave. Um. Feisty Jeweler331 tells us the chronicles of an IDE emulator pre-order. So this is a blog explaining the author's experience with pre-ordering what should have been a magical CD emulator. Sadly, it looks like lots and lots of promises not delivered on. And I've always, I'm, I'm not sure why, I'm sure it's difficult doing these things, but 
I've always thought it's a little bit weird how mature floppy emulation is, Gotex everywhere, uh, and similar devices, and how much hard disk emulation there is out there as well. But we don't seem to have a ubiquitous, simple IDE CD-ROM emulator to do the same thing because who likes when you when you're turning on a 1997 PC and hearing the, the CD drive spinning up? Yeah. And and having a CD collection and finding the right CD and CDs not being yeah. scratched. If you can just yeah. have a, a big old memory card in there with all your ISOs, away you go. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's what this promised, but it looks like it's not going well for them. Yeah. There are alternatives, things like Blue Scuzzy and so on, and there are IDE ones, but I don't think anyone's got the full, the full thing where you can even just plug in an audio cable and do all the rest of the things you want to do. Yeah. Um, Dr. Local has submitted a story. Um, it's not as big a deal as it sounds on the headline, but uh, Delta, which is a Nintendo emulator uh, for uh, for iOS, is it just Nintendo, or does it does do other systems? I think it does. I think it does other systems as well. Does other systems. I did it, Dave. You can play your Nintendos on on iOS with the Delta emulator, um, but the problem they ran into was that they used a logo that was very similar to Adobe's logo who are uh, perhaps just as famously litigious as Nintendo themselves. But that's a simple fix. New logo, problem gone. So that, that's that's easy to sort out. Um, from the article, it says, Delta topped the iPhone App Store last month following apps, uh, Apple's recent changes in App Store policy to allow video game emulator apps onto its storefront for the first time. The app, oh, uh, oh, this this clears it up. The app allows users to play downloaded ROMs of classics from the NES, SNES, N64, home consoles, as well as the uh, the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, and Nintendo DS. So very much a Nintendo yeah. thing. I, and Sega, obviously, as well. Yeah. The Half Sega. of those are Sega, aren't they? Half of those are Sega. Half of those are Segas. Oh, I thought they were Ataris, Dave. Move on. Dr. Local tells us about warnings from the Twilight Zone. To the Twilight Zone, I haven't watched in a long time. I really liked it, and I keep meaning to go back and do it. I don't know why I do, but there's um, warnings about the dangers of nostalgia, Uh, and I've taken a a quote directly from the article. While the Twilight Zone's fourth episode, the 16mm Shrine, dealt with the dangers of living in the past, it was the show's fifth episode, Walking Distance, that delivered its first masterpiece meditation on nostalgia. The Twilight Zone is a um, was a sci-fi show that it was originally in black and white, and they brought it back again. That did a single short story in each episode, and sometimes they were enormously hard hitting. There are some similarities, I guess, to Inside Number Nine. Do you ever watch that? Yes, I love those yeah. short. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And they always leave you at the end of it. They just leave you with this like, oh, a shudder, this, yeah. this weird sense at yeah. the end of each episode. Tale, Tales of the Unexpected was oh, a little yes. bit like that, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. fantastic. Um, and we, we don't really seem to get as much of that now. Black Mirror, in fact, is a bit Twilight Zone. I guess, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, SD Matt 22 submitted a story about the issues with uh, digital only software, a recurring um, subject matter that comes up here. Uh, there's a link here to the story which um, talks about how you can't actually bequeath your Steam library to somebody in your will, which is yet another thing to go on the list of disadvantages of digital ownership. But let's be fair, though, as long as you leave your password, you can just kind of log in as them, can't you, Dave? Will yeah, they're know? not. They're not going to see. Not well at the moment. Not until we get eye print scanners and all the rest of it. Yeah, or your date um, of birth is like, oh, yeah. it's one hundred and seventy years old. How is he still putting in seventy hours a week into Call of Duty? Steam, Steam team don't mind. Steam don't mind. <laughs> they they think that almost everyone is is born in nineteen hundred because you remember that you go to any game that needs an age check, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't click, have any. Click, click. Get past yeah, that. Yeah. Come on, show me the trailer. Yeah, first of January nineteen hundred, just like everyone else. Other retro Matt lets us know about um, Frogger, but what if there were no automobiles? Um, and a quick look, it does start off looking like Frogger, and before you know it, you're in a, a Nintendo style top down RPG type thing, or RPG light, or whatever you want to, want to call those GRPGs. 
And there is lots and lots more on the subreddit. Far too much to cover. We're already, but we're already going to go over the hour this week. Oh no! Lots to, I know, I know, I know. Sorry, Uncan. Uh, but lots and lots more on the subreddit. Go and have a look when you're on the toilet or you're skiving at work. Do you know what I know about Hudson Soft? No, nothing. <laughs> well, that's at least what I thought I did until I sat down and looked into the submission from Pajaco. I did find out that they made Jet Set Willy, except they didn't. Um, they, for some reason, ended up with a short lived UK subdivision uh, and they did one or more ports of Jet Set Willy. So that was one of the things cre- credited to them on Moby Games, which uh, stood out. The real Hudson Soft, of course, is a Japanese company named after Hudson Locomotives in 1973 by its two founders. Hudson are giants in the console world and they've made games like Bomberman and been involved in a surprising number of well-received ports like R-Type, Prince of Persia, Wonder Boy 3, Klax, and loads more. The biggest thing they've done, though, at least in, in my opinion, is the hardware side of things. In collaboration with NEC, they made the PC Engine console. It's a very neat little console. It was basically or technically an 8-bit machine, but you wouldn't know that when you're playing it. It had a 16-bit GPU, and it was very capable. It was um, probably fair to describe it as a 16-bit console, even if it wasn't a 16-bit console. It was of that that kind of era and capabilities. It was one of those exotic consoles that you'd see in magazines, but not so much in person. Um, in fact, if you're from the UK, you'd be forgiving in thinking it was an also-ran console, one of the ones that never really took off and flopped. You'd be wrong, though, because it ended up being the biggest rival to the Super Famicom, or as we know it, the Super Nintendo system, the SNES, but only in Japan, where it ended up selling more than the Sega uh, Mega Drive, or Genesis, as it gets called, in the United States of America. Um, We never got it in the UK at all, uh, except for imports. The Graphics release was cancelled, but it was the TurboGrafx-16 in the, the USA, and even that was a bit of a flop, and um, reasons given are it launched um, too late. Uh, it launched two years later in uh, the USA compared to Japan, and the marketing wasn't done right. Um, it was going to launch three years later than Japan and the UK, but they just cancelled it. It did end up, of course, getting the CD-ROM ROM expansion, which I know Neil loves saying. In fact, Neil, you've covered the PC Engine quite extensively on the channel. Uh, yeah. Those videos are definitely worth a watch to hear the history of it. And in my view, if you want to play late 80s or early 90s shooters, then you can't go far wrong with this. And my recommendation is Air Zonk not just because it's got Zonk in the name. Um, Sadly, though, after a long relationship with Konami that started back in 1985, Konami ended up with most of the shares by 2005. It became a subsidiary of Konami in 2011, and then it closed proper electronic art style in 2012, absorbed into Konami and gone. Now, the reason why we're talking about it is now a time extension article submitted by Pajaco about an event to celebrate 50 years since Hudson Soft was founded. And the event was at Loft Plus One in um, Kabuchiko, Shinjuku, Japan. Um, Feel free to correct my pronunciation in the comments. I won't read it. Um, I can't say happily 50 years to Hudson because sadly, like so many companies, they didn't make it. But they're a super important company nonetheless. Neil? They are. Oh, you've, you've caught me on the hop there, Dave, just by shouting my name. Neil, talk. Neil. Um, <laughs> go, let's go. Um, yeah, uh, the article itself is a bit of a short article, isn't it? Yeah. It just, it just kind of says, hey, guys, did you see this tweet? and then links to a tweet by Chris Covell, um, <laughs> which shows some pictures of the event. Uh, but, I mean, that's that's aggregated news sites in general these days, isn't it? Hey, did you see this tweet? Um, and then uh, the tweet in itself, well, it's a bit sad, really. There's some pictures. There's no video. There's no – doesn't look like there's any kind of fancy celebration. And there totally should be. Hudson should have a great big birthday cake with Bomberman jumping out of it and candles and – videos and all the rest of it they are a super important piece of gaming history 
um, either through the games or the hardware that they produced, but also the competition that they created. You mentioned there how they gave Nintendo a run for their money and they pushed Nintendo and they pushed Sega to better themselves and to, to the result was better games for everyone. They did also port a lot of well-known games to other platforms. So you mentioned R-Type there. There's a really good version of that on the PC Engine. Um, a standout title for that whole platform, really. Wonder Boy they ported, and that kind of evolved into a series called Adventure Island. And um, got a little factoid for you here, Dave. Did you know that in Adventure Island, what was Wonder Boy uh, in the UK version because this wasn't on the PC engine, I think. Well, I think it was, but it was also released for other systems. Um, Wonder Boy's name in the UK version is... Do you want to have a guess? Alex. No. It's Master Higgins. Master Higgins? Master Higgins on Adventure Island, yeah. And then you've got games like Bonk. If you've ever played Bonk 3 on a PC engine, the character sprite can grow to the size nearly of the entire screen. It really throws those sprites and those pixels around wonderfully um, in ways, certainly in that game, in ways you don't often even see on a Super Nintendo or a Mega Drive. It really does hold its own. It gave us Bomberman or Dyna Blaster, as others know it as. Uh, they made a bunch of games for the ZX Spectrum in its very early years, um, probably because it was also making MSX games and Z80, oh, yeah, so it's yeah. nice to port between the two. It even worked with Nintendo themselves to port things like Excite Bike for the PC-88. So they had reach across platforms, across generations. Uh, and despite being best known uh, in those, you know, these days, I guess they're probably best known for the PC Engine and Bomberman. They did a whole lot more besides um, and then carried on working, I guess, within Konami uh, and doing things with them. So I say give them a proper birthday Give Hudson Soft a proper birthday. Raise your glasses to them. Download an emulator. Play some games if you haven't done. There's some great shooters to play. There's lots of there's lots and lots of good games to play on it that you might not see elsewhere, as well as some some very good ports as well. Time now for our community question of the week. And last week we talked about MGV's video and the impact of Wolfenstein 3D and Doom. Wolfenstein uh, and and the impact that, that had on persuading people to move to the PC from whatever platform they were on. But we wanted to know what game made you change platform? Which platform did you move from? What did you move to? And what game was the influence? So let's have a little look. Have you taken us out of contest mode, Dave? So just remember... Just as with submitting stories, you can go to reddit.com forward slash this week in retro where you will find question of the week pinned. And then you can go and leave a comment there and tell us your experiences to share with us. We've got some long answers in this week's one, haven't we? Right. So uh, I have control of Reese at the top here with six upvotes. Um, and he says, my story also involves Wolfenstein 3D, so I shall share it here. My dad used to bring his work Amstrad 286 PC home at weekends. Yes, a whole hulking great desktop PC. And I remember playing Wolfenstein 3D with him and being a bit confused and somewhat terrified by the whole thing. In my defense, I would have been around eight years old. This PC didn't have a sound card. <clears throat> so our Wolf 3D experience was accompanied by those admittedly glorious PC speaker beeps and boops. I think you still got the screams on the PC speaker, didn't you? Yeah, you did. I think I, I, it, 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 um, PC speaker was an important thing for Wolfenstein and, and games of those either, because yeah. lots of lots of people had the PC speaker, so they had to they had to accommodate it as best they could. Yeah, so you did get crunchy gunshots and, and screams. Uh, he goes on to say, now, Dad was in friendly competition with one of the other dads in the street who also happened to own an Amstrad 286. I very vividly remember the day rival Dad brought home a shiny new 486 with a proper sound card and his son, a good friend of mine, showing off Wolf 3D with all the music and sound effects. I could tell that my dad was green with envy and within weeks, we also had a 486 complete with the ESS audio drive sound blaster clone to call our very own. So I have a good old case of keeping up with the Joneses, or in this case, the Smiths, to thank me for getting on the 90s PC bandwagon. An era I remember very fondly, of course, the uh, the rivalry continued when we got the internet 
and they got the internet and we got a voodoo card or sorry they got a voodoo card we got a voodoo card they got a cd burner we got a cd burner do you know what this tells me go on i want reese's dad on the show as a guest (laughs) it sounds Um, sounds like he's one of us yeah although they just going back to our original question hasn't actually changed platform he's gone from pc to better pc but mm. it's such a leap yeah you might as well call it a different yeah. platform yeah. 286 yeah. to a 486 yeah generation pixel Pixel. <laughs> generation pixel <laughs> money penny Gener- <laughs> surely some mistake uh generation pixel says in 1991 two games made me shelf my beloved specky civilization on the pc and Sonic the Hedgehog on the Mega Drive. See, the N- Nintendo coming up again. Yeah. Which meant that I was dual-wielding systems for the first time. Um, in 1996, Resident Evil completely dragged me to the Sony side. And now I'll hoard my wish. <laughs> well, the perfect system for you, sir, would have been the Amstrad Mega PC. Although that came yes. later than 91. But the Terror Drive was 91. But that would have been uh, an expensive import. Um, yeah, Civilization, huge game. Oh, yeah. uh, Sonic, big impact, I guess. Sonic. I'm, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to open the can of worms on on the Sonic discussion because that will go on forever. I'm go on, already do it, do over. It, do, it, do it, do it, do it. See it. Um, well, I, I was just going to go into the fact that I was already impressed by Mario. I was impressed by the speed of Sonic, but I actually my heart was still more in Mario than okay. Sonic, and I wasn't. Okay. I wasn't persuaded by mm. it was more yeah. games like streets of rage that persuaded me on the mega drive sure. anyway um dj hoffman have you ever heard of him dave he's got nope. a third answer here no nope. never heard of him never heard of him he says for me it wasn't about gaming i used my amiga for much more than that and i was a poor piracy back then. he used it for piracy <laughs> I had to wait very patiently for my dad to finally upgrade to a new PC to inherit his old Pentium 90, which by then wouldn't run any new games anyway. So what Hoffman is saying that he's desperately wanted to get out of the Amiga, but he had to wait? Um, yeah, I guess. Well, I guess, no, he was seeing the latest games on the PC. I mean, if, if the Pentium 90 was a hand-me-down, yeah, yeah. then we must have been yeah. into Late Pentium 90s. 200, yeah. you know, um, or 500 megahertz or something like that um, and it wouldn't so yeah I, poor poor DJ Hoffman yeah just a lump of gold for Christmas that's what we got <laughs> uh, I noticed Costardo uh, later on says it was in fact Wolfenstein 3D that made me switch from the Atari ST to the PC as it had to do my uni uh, programming assignments in Turbo Pascal my 1024 STFM was already equipped with at once, allowing me to run 2xx PC software with a high level, a very high level of compatibility. At the time, I was thinking that setup could last me a while. However, when I saw Wolfenstein running on my friend's 386SX, I realized my next computer purchase would have to be a PC. It still took me a while to actually get one, though. And, and that's a good point because at that point in the 90s, we went from PCs being extraordinarily expensive within a few years to becoming very affordable to the point where almost every household it seemed like had a pc by the end of the 90s if you couldn't afford it there was a uh, a higher purchase option available for you yeah. or a, you know um a loan option um other answers include kieran 80 who uses that classic it was easier to do my schoolwork with MS Office on a PC, I told my parents. But the first game I bought was Command & Conquer and spent many hours playing that with my friend over a modem. Um, Ori Pryor, Civil- Civilization 2. Nothing like that was available for me on the consoles. And um, who else? We've got Richard Shears. What's Richard? It was, we've got such long answers this week. We've got to just pick through them to find, I'm trying to find the name of the game. He's talking about hard drives. He had an Amiga uh, 1500. Ah, and then the images of NASCAR racing from Papyrus on the PC. That's what really grabbed his attention. That wasn't, that was a game with a lot of impact, NASCAR racing. And I don't mean, haha, crushing cars. I mean, the number of cars the texture mapping on the cars, you had the ability to mod it a little bit and you could make your own uh, paint job to go on the cars. Um, The destructible cars, it was just 
or it just looked like the perfect game. Now, if you were persuaded over, I can guarantee you, you didn't have a powerful enough PC to actually run it at full graphics mode. <laughs> you could never do that. That it was, it was the the um, the the crisis of its time. Um, but yeah, a great game, and I can see why you would have been persuaded by that. Any other stand out for you, Dave? Yeah. So many answers. Yeah, there's actually hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds of answers. Um, at the very bottom of the page, I noticed one from Double O Five Agima, which is the username of our friend Chris. Chris. Uh, he says the odd thing is when a game makes me jump, I often didn't end up buying that game. While owning a Spectrum, screenshots of Crazy Cars 2 on the Amiga looked photorealistic, and I had to have an Amiga. I never purchased that game, though, when he says in black, it's good job, really, because it, it wasn't that great a game. When loving flight sims in my Amiga, everyone was telling me about how awesome F-15 Strike Eagle 2 was, but that you really needed a PC to enjoy it. I jumped to PC and never once played F-15 SE 1 or 2. So the only one that springs to mind is Halo on the OG Xbox. He says, no wait, AVP on the Jag. And <laughs> he's got a good point. And I don't think it really undermines what we're saying because we saw these games that showed us what the system up from what we had could do and that made us think this system can't do it anymore i want these new games not necessarily this new game i mean for me it was dungeon master on the atari st i had to have that um and it was elite that sold me on the idea of having a computer at all but yeah it, we saw the kind of games that we had yeah mm. uh tej took a sideways step he said he sold his dreamcast with imported ikaruga sai because i wanted to play Windwalker on the GameCube. So he sold his Dreamcast um, at, at uh, CEX uh, to get a GameCube. I'm sure he got plenty of um, enjoyment out of that. Um, love a GameCube. Mike Daly, M MDF, um, PlayStation Ridge Racer, Arcade Perfect. The PC couldn't come close. It's a strong argument. Protech says, uh, <laughs> Leisure Suit Larry. Move me hmm. from my Commodore 64 to the world of PC. Um, yeah, wow. Wasn't expecting that answer in there. Did LSL not come out in the Commodore 64? I don't think it did, no. You might have got King's Quest, but I don't think you got... Let's see, Larry. What can, what can you find? Uh, I, I'm just... just uh, Yeah, uh, yeah, it came out on... DOS, Amiga, and Macintosh. Do you know, it was later than I thought. It was 1991. I thought Leisure Suit Larry was an earlier game, but no, it was 1991. Yeah. And I'm wrong. You didn't even get King's Quest. You, you got King's Quest on the Apple II. You know, the C64 would have been more than capable, but I'm not seeing that it was released. Surprising, I'm surprised. really. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know that he did get some LucasArts ones on the... Um... Oh, you got Maniac Mansion and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there you go. Um, well, there are so many more answers. So um, please, uh, Snoo Pandas, Halo on the Xbox. Yeah, please go and have a read through our subreddit. And that brings us on to this week's question of the week. Um, Dave, you did have a question that you talked about with our, our with our guest, with, uh, with Nolan. Um, are we going to still go with that question or are we going to come up with a new one? Let's, um, let's, let, let me tell you what the question is and you can decide if we're going to go with, go with it or not time now for this week's question of the week uh let's go back to uh super sprint or sprint uh, and talk about that so top down races specifically yeah. i think we'll allow bird's eye ones we'll allow um uh, scrolling ones but as long as it's top down so tell us about your favorite top down races or your top-down racing game memories. It might be the first you played. Uh, it might be memories of um, Sprint, uh, Championship Sprint, Super Sprint. Did you actually play Sprint 8? That would be cool to hear about mm. your memories of that. But top-down racers, tell us your favorites. Tell us all about them and your memories, and we will check them out next week. Dave, pleasure to spend uh, another uh, another sitting with you, talking about the retro of the yep. week. 
Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, going to return the compliment, Dave. Did you Did you enjoy? It's my company? always a pleasure yeah. to speak to you at any Thank opportunity, you. Neil. You are the, the my my favourite person in the whole world, my dearest friend, Neil. No, I, I do mean no, I, I, I do I, I do look forward to this. It's it's nice to force yourself to sit down and do this every week. It is because you are then in a position where you do relax and enjoy it. Whereas sometimes on a day off, I'd be too grumpy and I'd just do nothing with it. So it's, yeah. it's nice to do this. And for you, I know that otherwise you'd be working and this this, this forces you to take a, a bit of a break and have a chat. This is fun, yeah. And um, I hope for you, the listener, you've enjoyed hanging out with us today. Always a pleasure. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, assuming you're listening on a, on a Saturday when this comes out. And um, all the links to all the stories are in the show notes. Of course, patreon.com forward slash this week in retro if you'd like to support us reddit.com forward slash this week in retro if you'd like to uh, read or contribute stories and we'll see you next week take care bye bye he's waving and so is neil see you next week folks bye bye this week in retro was presented by neil from rmc the cave and dave it was produced by me duncan styles the podcast version of the show is available through your favourite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r stroke this week in retro to suggest and vote on the stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you enjoy our show and would like to support it, then please check out the link to our Patreon page in the show notes or description. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.